And now for tonight's speaker, Dr. Kelly Fanto Dietz is the Director of Programming, Education, and Visitor Engagement at Stratford Hall. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Africana Studies and History from the College of William and Mary, a Master's Degree in African American Studies, and a PhD in African Dis Dis Disaspora Studies, Diaspora, I always get that wrong, from the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Dietz serves as an adjunct professor at Randolph College and is a research consultant at the James River Institute for Archaeology. She also works as a historical consultant for several museums throughout the Mid-Atlantic and has partnered with National Geographic on multiple projects, including the documentary film Rise Up, The Legacy of Nat Turner. Tonight, she will speak about her critically acclaimed book, Bound to the Fire, How Virginia's Enslaved Cooks Helped Invent American Cuisine, which was named as one of the top 10 books on food in 2017 by Smithsonian Magazine. Please give a warm welcome to Kelly Dietz. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. That was kind of okay. Good evening. Much better. Oh my goodness. Wake up, everybody. It is an honor to be here. I actually had two Mellon fellowships here while I was in graduate school. My son was in a stroller, and I brought him here two summers in a row and worked in the archives, which was then the Virginia Historical Society. Um, the archives then turned into my dissertation, which turned into my book. So it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And also, thank you all for coming um, to my talk tonight. I want to talk for a moment about the title of my book, because this was something that plagued me for a while. So I knew I wanted to say, or to have it named Bound to the Fire. That was an easy one for me. The subtitle was tricky. I had all these ideas about labor, about enslavement, and all these things that I really felt like I was focusing on. And the, pub the publisher said, no, it's going to be this, How Virginia's Enslaved Cooks Helped Invent American Cuisine. And I thought to myself, this book isn't about food. This book is about the people. And so I sort of struggled back and forth. And the whole point of this, because you know I was a professional chef for 10 years, I'm an archaeologist, I'm a scholar of the African diaspora, a lot of this was absolutely from the food. That's why I was brought to the study. But I felt like it was more than that. And then I found myself reading the book for the first time, because you don't read it. When you write it, you write chapter 5, then maybe chapter 2. And I started to see why they were saying that. And I also like the fact that it has this sort of I don't know, softer title, because it brings people to the book, it brings people in, it lures them in to tell the stories of the men and women who were enslaved, who actually worked in the kitchens that I talk about in my book. The, t <clears throat> the purpose of my book um, is very in line with what Michael Twitty calls culinary justice culinary justice. So it's a political piece. It's important to, to raise up the stories of the enslaved, no matter who they were, but in particular for my book, the story of the enslaved cooks, the men and women who literally were bound to the fire against their will and who created not only American cuisine, Southern cuisine, but the idea and the functionality of Southern hospitality. My book aims to redefine the history and legacy of enslaved cooks against incredible myths, which I will talk about in a moment. And I wanted to bring attention not just to the cooks, but to the historic kitchens that stand around the state and throughout the South that are falling apart. Lastly, I want to tether the romance of food to the pain and reality of enslavement. I guarantee that many of you came here tonight, maybe not having read my book, wanting to hear about the puddings and the pies and that kitchen life. I will be talking about that a little bit. But the focus of my book and what I'll be talking about tonight is how I did my research, the things that I found out, the history and legacy of the actual people who did the work that made our cuisine what it is. I'm going to start out, and I do not read my book at these talks, but I am going to start out with a sobering story. I want to introduce you to one of the cooks that I talk about in my book. It's short, but I do want to set the tone for the rest of the lecture. <clears throat> Give me one second. My dog ear didn't quite work. Okay. Surrey County, Virginia, 1860. It was the eve of the Civil War, and Sookie went to bed every night thinking about the labor of her days. 
Cooking on a Surrey County plantation was a stressful task that occupied all five of her senses and consumed almost every moment of her life. She provided several meals a day to the white family who enslaved her and to whomever came to visit. Food was more than sustenance. It was at the core of Virginia hospitality. Her friends in the field worked from sunup to sundown while Sookie remained bound to the fire in the big house's kitchen 24 hours a day. She was forced to cook multiple meals that were both spontaneous and scheduled. Up every day before bon dawn, Sookie baked bread for the mornings, cooked soups for the afternoons, and prepared divine feasts for the evenings. She roasted meats. She made jellies and puddings and created desserts for every free person who passed through that plantation. Sookie lived in the kitchen, slept upstairs above the hearth during the winters, and often moved outside come summertime. Her children learned to cook and work in the big house and were always under the watchful eye of the white family. Private moments were rare. She rose early to bake, cooked all day, and went to bed with the next day's menu both in her mind and on the large hearth on the first floor of her kitchen quarter. Cooking for a Virginia plantation was a challenging task, one that required culinary talent, nuanced social skills, and physical strength. The labor was intense, lifting huge pots of water, standing for hours by the open fire. Her work day, day bled into the night with no space for rest. Sookie was a typical enslaved cook, and undoubtedly she worked herself to death. Cooking provided her and her family with the unique status within the bonds of enslavement, but it came at a high price. In 1860, Sookie died at the age of 50 from a hemorrhaged room, likely caused by overexerting herself for the sake of Virginia's famous hospitality. There is going to be moments during my talk tonight where I will pause and I will read names of people who were cooks. All I have in the archives, all that was there were names, and so I feel it's important to say them out loud and to have people hear them. So before we get started, I want to talk about what this myth is. What are these myths that I had to push back against? And oh my goodness, are they there? Familiar, anybody? Don't have to raise your hands, but I know for a fact there's probably at least a dozen of you that are thinking, I got some of that in my house, don't know what to do with it. Every single time I give this talk, somebody comes from the audience afterwards and shame and says, I got this thing. I don't know what to do with it. Do you want it? So I have this bizarre collection of this stuff that people have sent me over the last decade. It's, it's a weird thing to be forced to collect. But I want to talk about what this myth means, because when I started my work talking about these enslaved cooks, people push back. Average people you know, push back that I met at the grocery store. Scholars push back. We already know the story of these enslaved cooks. We know who Aunt Jemima is. And if you think about the propaganda that created these and how powerful that was, that even in 2009 when I was diving into the archives, doing oral history, looking at the archaeological record, people still felt like they knew the story because she's at Food Lion. She's in your cupboard. Everybody knows who Aunt Jemima is. So these myths came about during the 19th century. Um, they really sort of started taking mold around the 1830s when the minstrel show started kicking in and all of the sort of uh, pushback against the abolitionist literature. These slaves were happy. They were loyal, right? They loved being part of the family. My family owned slaves and they were, not me, but I'm saying I hear this, you know, my family were good slave owners, right? This kind of narrative was attached to this racist memorabilia. It depicted them as happy, loyal, illiterate, not able to read or write or speak correctly. And their sole purpose was to please white people. And you see this even up until the 1940s, you've got this how Aunt Jemima makes another couple happy. She's there, she's making food, and everyone's all happy, except for her, right? Except for the way that she's pre presented here. They also, there's also a myth that these people in the cook, the men and women, if you worked in the house, somehow you weren't connected to the folks working in the field, that somehow you left behind all your cultural heritage and history and pride from West Africa that was brought over on those slave ships and, and passed down to you, that you left that in the field, and once you got into that white landscape of that house, you became that happy, loyal slave. That is a myth that still permeates, and I push back heavily against it. The crazy thing about this, there's lots of crazy things, but what really puzzles me is that there is this contradiction, right? Blatant imagery of black cooks everywhere, yet there's been no 
attribution given to them for their legacy and their history in American food. One of the biggest uh, issues that sort of permeates that idea is the one that we hear at plantation museums, the one that is depicted in, in images like this from Berkeley Plantation. It's a painting from the 1950s. What do you see here? Who's cooking? It's a white lady, right? So these ideas are also baked into the idea that white ladies, the mistress of the house, was doing all the cooking. So give her the credit for Southern food. There's been a lot of politics around this, and this is something that my book pushes back against pretty uh, sternly and also likes to question. Before we get to Virginia, and again, my training is in African diaspora studies, and I think it's very important to root this history in West Africa, where a lot of these people came from, where their ancestors came from. My work is also um, what some call Afrocentric, and that the perspective of my, of my book, I start out the book talking about Suki. It is through the eyes and the experiences of, of African Americans instead of through the lens of the white planter. It's a very different way of doing history, and it's a way that I was trained in my particular discipline. So you have a picture here on the left. <clears throat> it's from the 18th century. It is a kitchen <clears throat> in the Guinea-Bissau area of, of West Africa. You've got a map here of, of, of Africa during the 18th century as well. So I want to think for a minute, what is the African and African-American? Because people tend to forget that part of it, right? What is the African and African-American? When you learn about the history of West Africa, and when I learned about it in undergrad and in and grad school, I couldn't help look at the bodies that were enslaved in the kitchen as well in a different kind of way. So these people came from kingdoms and queendoms. They were not slaves that were brought here. They were princes. They were warriors. They were daughters. They were mothers. They were enslaved and brought here to Virginia, and then some of them ended up in these kitchens. They came from rich cultures. They were ethnically diverse. <clears throat> and they also had a very rich history of cooking some of the dishes that have become part of the American cuisine DNA. Here's just a, a quick chart. I'm sure most of you have seen this. The African diaspora consists of the trade that happened for 400 plus years, where estimated 12.5 million people were put on ships and sent throughout the diaspora. Those are the ones that are counted, right? Those are the ones that are counted. David Eltis out of uh, Emory, I think he's retired now, has spent his career uh, with a, making a data, data, database called Slavery Voyages. It has an incredible amount of quantitative data, and it really lays out just the numbers, the different colonies, you know, how many were the Spanish trading, etc. And it's a really powerful tool to teach, and it's something that's really important when you're thinking about out of that 12.5 million that were counted, not the ones that you know, uh, rebelled during the way over and fell over, were murdered or killed, only 4% of those came to the United States. So in places like Brazil, that had the longest and highest number of captured West Africans, their food is almost identical to West and Central African cuisine. You have to dig a little bit more here in this 4% of the United States, this 4% of Virginia, to see those little seeds of what was once West African food. All right, so this is Stratford Hall. This is where I work. <clears throat> my work in this book and my focus of this book was to focus on 18th and 19th century plantations. And I did that because one, the records were decent, and also it was during this period of the 18th and 19th century where slavery became a dominant part of the culture in Virginia. So in the 1600s, think about Jamestown, think about the starving time. They weren't worried about what was for dinner in terms of having a nice five course meal. They were eating rats. They were eating each other half the time. I mean, there's like crazy cannibalism going on in Jamestown. They were not worried about the China that they were eating off of or the kinds of food that they wanted to impress the Carters with, right? So you see this influx of West African slaves enslaved West Africans, rather, coming into the colony. You see a height, a heightened of women coming in, and these households are starting to be built. So 1619 is you have the first Africans coming here to what's British North America, and you also have these plantation complexes starting to grow and grow in a, a very distinct kind of way. So cuisine changed from being something that just fed you, like just food, to actual cuisine during the early 18th century, late 1700, or late 17th century. Who here knows these pineapples? 
They are everywhere. They are absolutely everywhere. <clears throat> I went to William and Mary, and they are all over the place there. The hospitality house is now gone, but you see these all over the South. What do they stand for? Hospitality, hospitality right? That, most people know that, but why do they stand for hospitality? So hospitality and Southern culture became one and the same because you had this Atlantic trade, the same map that I showed a moment ago where all of the, the captured West Africans were being shipped around, so was food. There were things like okra, black-eyed peas, right, uh, watermelon, all these, it, all these crops that were coming from West Africa, peanuts, coming over on those same ships, landing here in Virginia. You also have the Caribbean, uh, you know, sort of completely erupting with these plantations, with people that had a plantation here and a plantation down in Barbados. Right? So you have this connectivity. We think of Virginia history as a sort of insular thing. But during this period, before the revolution, there was this Atlantic world that was just bellowing with this sort of cultural collisions that were happening. So imagine, say, at Stratford Hall, the home of the Lees, which they have amazing probates, and I've been going through them. It's been really fascinating. You would have a shipment of, say, some rum from Barbados. Right? And they had a lot of that there. The rum was made by enslaved labor. Rum is actually a West African recipe. So in Barbados, the birth of rum is where they had enslaved Africans, you know, making other things, the sugar cane, you know, they were throwing away all the, all the sort of dregs of it. And there was a long history, I'm talking thousands of years history, of making palm wine and other distilled liquors in West Africa. And so the enslaved community down there were like, you know what, we're taking this, we're going to go ferment it, and we're going to make ourselves our own liquor. Turned out being discovered, of course, not discovered, but sipped on by the white planters, and then it became one of the biggest, biggest uh, sort of... Uh, you know, uh, items in the Atlantic trade. It still is to this day. Rum is a very, very popular dish. But on those same shipments of rum and other things, you might end up with a pineapple. So you go somewhere and there's, you know, a couple of pineapples. This ship goes all over the place. You end up on the Potomac and you got one pineapple left, <laughs> right? The rest of them have rotten or you've given them away to pirates. I mean, who knows, right? You've got one pineapple left. You give Mr., let's just say, Thomas Lee this treasured pineapple, right? He takes this exotic fruit, which you can get everywhere now, takes this exotic fruit, and mind you, celery was also exotic back then, don't ask. <laughs> you take this exotic fruit and you keep it because the Carters are coming over, right? The Lees and the Carters were really good friends. So you keep that pineapple and you hope that it doesn't rot in the week that it takes them to get up here from Shirley, and you sit there and you wait till they show up at that dinner table, right? They get there, you're eating all the food that the enslaved cook and assistants made, and then out comes the pineapple, the forbidden exotic fruit from the Caribbean, and it is so rare, and you are so wealthy because you are trading enslaved people, you are trading rum, you are trading all of these things that you have this delicate pineapple that you're gonna share with your guests. So there's hospitality. If that's not hospitality, I don't know what it is. You have this crazy exotic fruit. I don't think celery ever, I don't think it would have made it on the, you know, <laughs> the columns in Virginia, but they did, we do have a fancy celery glass you gotta come up and see at Stratford. They actually made physical glass jars for celery because you showed it off on your dinner table. But again, we're not talking about celery, but we are. <laughs> <clears throat> So I want you to also imagine, and for many of you are probably either historians or you know, amateur historians, these women and these plantations were so isolated from one another. One of the things that I did in my work is I read through here and at William & Mary and at UVA and other places, countless letters back and forth from these white plantation mistresses who were incredibly lonely. All they did was plan the next dinner party because they had to marry their kid off and they wanted to make sure the food was just right. So these plantations became spaces not just to grow wealth, but to flex your wealth, right? A stage to flex your wealth, to invite different people over, to show off the latest dance, right? The Virginia Reel. How on earth I learned that growing up in Berkeley, California, I do not know, but it was taught in a square dancing class. I have no idea how that happened, but I'm happy it did, because when I got out here, I actually knew kind of what I was doing, even though I'm really bad at it. 
So Virginia Reel, these dances, these balls, this is the majority of what these women were talking about in these missives back and forth. And you really got an idea of not only the frequency of these dinners that they were having, but the importance of them, right? They want to make sure it's the whole keeping up with the Joneses. I got to make sure my dinner is better than the lady down the street because I got a daughter and she's 22 and she might as well be an old maid and she's got to marry the next guy, right? So food was very much a part of the ways in which these, these planters and these women in particular flexed their wealth and married their children off. <clears throat> now I'll talk for a moment about something that drives me crazy. So one of the myths that I've spent my last 15 years sort of pushing back against is this idea, who here has been to a plantation museum and heard, and I know I'm gonna see all your hands go up, who here has heard that they move the kitchens outside because of fire? Right? Everyone says that. Has anyone ever thought, wait a second, anybody? It's a little weird, right? So here's the quote that everybody loves to use as proof of that insane myth. All the drudgeries, this is in 1705, all the drudgeries of cookery, washing, dairies, etc., are performed in offices detached from their dwelling houses, which by this means kept, I'm sorry, are kept more cool and sweet. Smells are outside, there's no fire. Stratford Hall has 16 fireplaces inside. Come wintertime, those fireplaces are all lit. The children's room has a fire going 24-7, but God forbid the kitchen fire is going 24-7. Houses didn't, kitchens didn't catch on fire that much back then. Stratford Hall did once, but they handled it. So the idea that somehow the fire is you know, reason for this happening is a little peculiar to me. Additionally, houses in the Northeast did not move their kitchens outside to the same extent. Houses in England didn't do it. There was something about the DNA of what was happening uh, in 1705, around the late 1600s, particularly in Virginia and the South, that I would argue, and other architectural historians will argue, had a lot to do with that moving it of the outside. You have an influx of women coming into the colony. You have these big plantation houses being built. You also have an influx at that point of mostly African men coming in and cooking the food. Moving that kitchen outside was a physical markation of the, the growing ideology of race because it took a while to form and the solidification of race and caste. This is the same period that slave codes started popping up all over the South. So you have these laws being put into place to control black bodies, and you have spaces, these larger plantations that could afford to build a kitchen outside, starting to build these kitchens outside. Another bit before I move on from the slide that cracks me up a little bit is the idea of the kitchens being smelly. Now, how often do people bathe in 1705? <laughs> So they're telling me on these tours, which I just bite my cheeks and smile, that somehow that, you know, I don't know, let's pick a Lee, Henry, you know, Henry Lee's feet somehow didn't smell, you know, as, as, as bad as the roasted goose that they're making in the kitchen. So again, sometimes it takes a little bit of just sort of logical thinking to push back against these myths. And then also it sort of puts and inserts the real reason, right? The racial reason, like the, the history of this, this institution of slavery and enslaved people into this narrative. Here's our kitchen at Stratford Hall. I want to talk for a minute about the labor, the labor that went into this. So I was a professional cook. Um, some would say chef. When I was catering, I was a chef. When I was in the restaurant, they're like, nope, you're over there on that part of the line. Um, I did that for years, for a decade cumulatively. My family's in the restaurant industry. When I see a menu for a dinner, or if I'm going to someone's house for dinner, and I know that they're making a four-course meal with six or seven things each course, I think, my God, who on earth is making this? That's a lot of work, right? Because I know what each one of those things is. Who here has to make Thanksgiving dinner every year? Who dreads it? absolutely dreads it because you can have someone's bringing the mac and cheese but who's doing the turkey the gravy the mashed I mean like all that stuff that you have to do all of those things take time so again using very pragmatic logical lens to look at these recipe books that I looked in so the cooks lived in the kitchens for the most part here is Stratford Hall it's a half kitchen and half laundry they cooked in there they they lived in there sometimes upstairs like I said about Sookie they worked 24 hours a day 
They were always on call. Something about Southern hospitality, which I think was, was great for some and not so great for others, was that you could show up after traveling, right, for three days on horseback or in carriage, show up at 11 o'clock at night, at 2 o'clock in the morning, and those bell systems that were put into these homes, just like Downton Abbey, would ring, and guess who had to get up and do the cooking? Not the missus of the house. So the cook would be, you know, sometimes some of these menus that I saw in my research too, I mean, incredibly complicated dishes that they were making that sometimes took days for one dish out of one course with several five to seven things on the table each time, right? So the amount of work that it would go to put into this, they would have to also wear uh, layers of clothes and sometimes wet down their skirts, their, their aprons, to keep from catching fire because he did not have a wolf stove unless you were Thomas Jefferson with like, you know, his fancy stew stove. Everybody else was cooking on the ground in pots, right? Who here has done hearth cooking? I am shocked. Normally, it's like half the audience, and they're like, I know about this, so I can say some stuff you won't even know. I'm just kidding. Um, so a lot of this stuff, and also burns, right? Enslaved cooks died from burns more than anything else. And I've heard this through oral history, and I, one woman in Philadelphia pushed back, and she's like, that's not true. And I was like, well, you know, 12 different African-American women told me this about their ancestors, so I tend to believe that over a record that doesn't exist. They would have to put their arm in the oven, if it burned a little bit, it was ready to bake the bread. They were baking bread every day. Some of them were baking bread just for the white family. Some of them were baking bread for the white family and for some of the folks that worked in the house, the domestics. So again, like just continual pain, right? Work, heat. One of the things that I discovered, which I found really interesting to me, is you know, going back to what I said in the beginning of this idea that somehow the field, you know, the, the field uh, folk were down there and the kitchen folk were up there and that the people in the field never hung out with the people in the house. It was this big divide. I found so many references to the kitchen being the place that was open all night, but that the little white kids were hanging out in all night long. And the folks from the field would come up when the sun went down, and they would come up and they'd get a little sneak, a little food this and a little food that, and play some music. And again, I'm not saying, again, I'm tethering the, the romance of food to the pain of enslavement. I'm not saying that somehow because they were playing you know, music, they were those happy slaves. I'm saying that that was a mode of survival, of perseverance. You cannot just be broken down. You have to live, and they were able to find moments in this space moments in this space where the people from the field can come up and they can feel just for a moment, right? Like something was somewhat normal. And I kept finding records of this in slave narratives and you know, white folks were talking about it. Philip Fithian was like, oh, the kitchen is always alive with people and they're playing music and it's crazy. And I was like, no way. And then all of a sudden, one of my presentations before the book came out, this right here is a kitchen planta a plantation kitchen, White Sulphur Springs, this is a wedding. They would have weddings in these kitchens. Again, complicating this idea of somehow these, you know, this sort of invisible wall between the folks working in the house and the folks working in the field. So these kitchens were contested landscapes, right? They were a space where the mistress would come down in the morning doing what they call carrying the keys. They would lock up the things like sugar and some of the expensive spices. They would come down, the mistress would come down carrying the keys, unlock some things, talk to the cook in the morning, and then go about her business writing letters that I got to read, which was great, multiple of these. There were sites of pride in the food when I was reading the slave narratives, people talked about the abuse that happened to their ancestors, right? This one woman was talking about how her mother was uh, burned the biscuits one, and the, once and the mistress brought her down to the granary, stripped her naked when she was pregnant and beat her. So you can't burn the food because there's all that wrapped up in showing off your wealth and your sophistication. You gotta marry your daughter off. You can't have burnt food, right? At the same time, that food was phenomenal and it was talked about throughout the colony. Virginia really was on the map, and I'm not talking about just Thomas Jefferson and James Hemings, who was actually doing the cooking. I'm talking about the food. People were talking about it all over Europe. They were coming here to eat. Virginia became known for feasting, right, for coming and, and eating. So you have this, this kitchen as a contested space of, yes, you have weddings there, but it's also the space where you might burn something and get beat. 
and the work that I do, and again, I know this is sobering, but slavery is sobering, right? And this is part of what I want to do is show that we can talk about their contributions and also what they had to do to do it. Another thing I love hearing on plantation tours is all the talk about these hidden passageways, right? Um, who here has seen any hidden passageway in Virginia? They're everywhere, right? Some of them are interpreted better. Some of them are absolutely interpreted, I mean, interpreted horrendously. Um, this is one of those, those moments where, just like when the, the kitchen moved outside, one of those moments where the architectural starts to respond to the politics of the time. So you start seeing these underground passageways, which have no architectural you know, style or anything. They're literally like at Berkeley Plantation. They're a hole dug from the kitchen to the main house, right? Then you have the ones like at Mount Vernon or other places. Montpelier had one that fell down. They've excavated it where it's more of a, you know, Palladian design. Like, oh, we're just going to make it look nice because we're obsessed with Greek and classical architecture. Again, you can be obsessed with classical architecture and also know that there's a function of that in a period after the uh, Revolutionary War when these started popping up where people like Tom, uh, Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. The conversations around freedom, around slavery, were being held at the dining rooms in these Virginia plantations, in the parlors. This is a dumb waiter. Think about that for one second. Dumb waiter on the left, brought back from France by Thomas Jefferson. You can replace an actual human being enslaved with one of these. In between every two person, you have a dumb waiter. You can put all the food in there, and you don't have to worry about any of the enslaved people listening to conversations about freedom. Additionally, if you have someone visiting from a, a nation that had already abolished slavery, people knew they were going to Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. They knew that he was a slave owner. Absolutely. But there's, one, there's, there's ways in which these things flexed to be able to mask and limit the exposure of what was happening. You see these popping up again uh, during the Revolutionary War, and again, another sort of uh, spike in them right after the closing of the transatlantic slave tra trade, 1807-1808. <clears throat> so one of the things that they say also is that these covered passageways were a really nice way to cover the enslaved waiters from the, you know, the weather, right? That makes a lot of sense, given the fact that everything else was going on with slavery. Um, slave quarters were disastrous. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a strange, peculiar narrative that they, that they choose to tell, right? So these all-weather passageways are ways in which to sort of like erase the actual function of them. And my absolute favorite one that drives me insane, and I apologize if there's anyone here from Berkeley Plantation, but apparently this is down now, and I would love it uh, in my own collection. This is a sign, Whistling Walk Underground Passage. Anybody here from Berkeley? Okay, I'm safe. Everything's good. <laughs> Bless their hearts. They've, they've done a lot of work recently, and I'm very happy with that. But a lot of these plantations are just stuck, right? They're stuck in these old narratives and that happy slave thing. This story, I went on this tour beginning in 1993. The last time, I want to say, was in 2009. For all those years, and I kept waiting for something correct to be said, right? They say, who here has been to Berkeley? A lot more of y'all than the hearth cooks I asked a little bit ago, so that's good. So you get the tour, right? And you're let, you're let out. No mention of enslavement or slave labor. It's like, you know, here's some, some men history and here's some decorative arts. There might be a lady in there, maybe. And then, oh, here's the whistling walk passageway. The kitchen's not interpreted. It is now. Um, and they tell the story that they would make the enslaved uh, cook or waiter whistle while they walked from the kitchen to the uh, dining room because they didn't want them eating the food. So again, I'm like, this just does not make any sense, right? The whistling thing has a history of that happy slave narrative, and it's very sort of loaded with this sort of ideas. But who on earth thought that the cook wasn't in there actually tasting the food? So I, I pried and I pried, didn't get anything there. I started thinking about it. This is a sort of 1930s, 40s sign. Height of Jim Crow America. My theory is that that story and this sign was put up because we went from, we, it's not me, not my ancestors, we went from, Virginia went from having these uh, plantations where these enslaved cooks were literally, I mean, elbow deep in biscuit dough, cooking all the food. There was, uh, you know, 
uh, enslaved black women were nursing white babies. It was a very different kind of racial landscape than what Jim Crow decided it was going to be. So you have this forced intimacy, whether it's rape and sexuality, or whether it's nursing one's child, or cooking one's food, and then Jim Crow comes around, and it's like, uh-oh, separate sides of the bus, different drinking fountains. So it's a strange thing. This is a piece that I'm working on right now, where the rewriting of that slavery uh, sort of society, the, the sort of textures of that, was rewritten to play into this notion of separation. Which really, I mean, yes, in status, they were separate. But most uh, elite women, like at Stratford, they had, uh, you know, the men had uh, manservants walking them around everywhere, giving them all that they needed. They were sleeping at the foot of their bed, taking their, their human waste outside at night. And then all of a sudden, you have this. Anyways, another thing that I'm pushing back against. <laughs> Here's a, a classic picture of a parlor, again, talking about politics and food and slavery. And a lot of people will say to me, because I, I give talks on not just this, but on other topics related to enslaved people, and they'll say things like, my ancestors didn't own slaves. Why should I care? And I say, look, back then, let me tell you something. You smoked tobacco. You were participating in the institution of slavery. You were drinking rum. You were drinking wine. You were drinking beer. You were drinking whiskey. All of these things were made by enslaved labor. And I'm not saying that you should feel weird about it or guilty about it, but my God, it was so much a part of the fabric of this country that it's bizarre to me that we've decided to not think of it that way. Let's get to the food here for a moment. I get a little preachy, I apologize. <clears throat> so the dining room was where all of the labor of the enslaved cooks and the planning that happened with the cooks and the, and the mistress of the house played out. And I want you to think about the amount of food. So during the 18th century, food became all about showing off your wealth, but also just an abundance of food. You would never eat all the food on a table. So you would have a ton of food that showed that not only you were wealthy, but your missus you know, read Mary Randolph or had her own cookbook of her own. And it was all about showing off not just your worldly sort of, you know, uh, connections with the pineapple, but also the skills of your enslaved chef, but always under the sort of mask of the mistress of the house. <clears throat> so I want to talk about food that they were actually eating. Of course, they were eating European inspired food. Absolutely. Right. This was like, you know, the sort of uh, we wanted back in the day, Virginians wanted to be just like their motherland. So like a lot of the English food was being brought over. That was very much a part of what they wanted. But they had new crops here, not only native crops, things like potatoes or corn, but they had things that were being brought over. Like I said, like okra, right? Like black eyed peas being brought over peanuts from, from West Africa on those slave sh uh, same slave ships as the enslaved Africans. Who here has, has peanut soup? Like Surrey County, yes, finally. I gave this talk the other day and it's like nobody knew what I was talking about. And I was like, wow, where do you live? Anyways, I'm happy that you have had peanut soup. Um, but peanut soup is a direct, it's not even a descendant. It is like a twin sister of a West African ground nut stew. They were making the same exact things. One pot meal back in West Africa. Think about that slide that I showed at the very beginning. They would get the food together, they would come in, they would put the peanuts in there and they grind them down. You put some chicken, some greens, lots of pepper. You would also have things on the, uh, that you would see in these menus that I'm reading, these cookbooks that were written by hand. Things like gumbo became being written into these, these recipe books. Now, I would say, Virginia, I almost called the, the uh, Historical Society this place right here, the archives have a great collection of these old cookbooks. Another thing that I did is I looked through not only at sort of what was being written and when, and sort of track that. But I also did something that I think anybody does. You get a hand-me-down cookbook. Your grandma passes away. You get her cookbooks. You get that one from church that she used every Sunday. And you kind of put it on the counter, and then it opens up. It's the dirtiest page in the cookbook. It's got notes all over it. Was she cooking that, or was she cooking the page that looks like it's never been opened? Those historical cookbooks still have that same kind of thing. They've got all the subtext. They've got the spills of things and the smell. And then some of those pages, my god, that food must have been horrible because it was written down, cooked once, and never cooked again. <laughs> so what I did is I, I traced the, the evolution of these recipes. And in the 18th century, you have a bunch of European food. 
by the end of the 18th century, and my God, by the 19th century, you see things like pepper pot. You see things like gumbo. You see jambalaya, which is a direct descendant of jollof rice from West Africa. You see peanut soup, okra and tomato stew. That African food became American food. They were eating it in the 18th century. They were tasting it. They were learning about it. But my God, if you write a recipe down that someone cooks, that passes something, right? So in these handwritten cookbooks from these white mistresses, you can see the change over time. Something else that was in these <clears throat> cookbooks were poison, medicine. I want to take a moment to talk about what's in the back of these books. So the first part of these cookbooks, it's all food, right? Things to eat. The last part of these cookbooks are things like tonics. The difference between medicine and poison is dosage. You take one Motrin, you're good. You take a whole bottle, you're in the ER. So think back to the woman that burned the biscuits. Think back to the, the if you've read my book, to the other men and women who were accused of poisoning their enslavers. Think back to that and think what kind of threat did they pose in that space? Did they have something that I call soft power? They were enslaved, but you know what? If you were going to die during this period and during the late 18th century, second to theft, poisoning was the second most popular tried crime in the state of Virginia. That was not happening by, you know, that was enslaved cooks poisoning their enslavers. I'm going to stop for a moment and just read some names, as I said I would, if I can find them here. <clears throat> and I want you to think as well that these people that I'm about to name, which I think is really important to say their name, that most of them may or may not have tried to poison their enslaver. There was no germ theory back then. A lot of the recipes I read are so you put something in the corner, you let it sit for a few days, and it bubbles up, you peel the bubbles off, and then you eat it. <laughs> so there was, you know, rarely was there refrigeration. Nobody knew about any of this stuff. So it could just be a really bad case of diarrhea, or you could have been poisoned. So think about this as I read these names, because not all of these men and women intentionally tried to poison their master. And I do this in the book, oops. I do this in the book, and it's, it's, if you've read it, I sort of arrest the narrative of the notorious chefs, right? The James Hemings and the Hercules, who I'll talk about in a moment when I close. But I arrest that narrative with a sobering, again, another sobering moment of naming and talking about the execution of these men and women who may or may not have intended to kill their enslaved or try to poison their enslaver, um, but were accused of it and executed because. Eve Cuffey Tol Coleman, Peter Wiley, Peter Phillips, Taffy Ware, Dick Harrison, Hudson, Asher. Randolph, Asher. Judith Harrison, Asher. Caesar Carrington, Asher. Dolan Reynolds, Asher. Isaac Thornton, Asher. Mark Balling, Asher. Mingo Corbin, Asher. Harry Key, Asher. Chastity and George Lawson, Asher. Bob Steinbridge, Asher. Fanny Goode, Asher. Billy Atkinson, Asher. Daniel Bransford, <clears throat> Delp Mitchell, Asher. Rennie and Fanny Dawson, Eliza Griffin, Asher. Roberta Easel, Asher. Richard Nichols, Asher. Down and Harry Nichols, Asher. Colin Johns, Asher. and Dick and John Spencer. One of the things that the archaeology let me do in this book um, is look at the religious practices, speaking of the ancestors at this moment, um, there is this misconception that as you moved closer to that white landscape and into that house, that you somehow disconnected yourself from not only the folks in the field, but your African roots. What I absolutely um, was blown away by in looking at the archaeology, which is the way in which, in, you know, as an archaeologist, it's really important to look at that archaeological record of the enslaved because they weren't, unless for, you know, it's a very few exceptions, writing their own narrative, telling the stories, testifying on their own. And so archaeology is able to speak to the present and to the future from the past in a way that other things cannot. 
One of the things that I found absolutely most powerful in looking at these archaeological collections throughout Virginia and through the help of James River Institute for Archaeology and University of Virginia that had another collection is that I started finding these caches, right? West African, uh, in West African religious cosmology, um, as they came over, there was, you know, it was ethnically diverse, religiously diverse, but one thing that stuck with most of them is the idea of the ancestors and the idea of the crossroads. And you would have, you have in these archaeological collections, uh, caches of crystals and shells and coins and metal to conjure the ancestors, to put spells on people. And they were found, they were found in the kitchen, in the hearth, in the same exact place, in dozens of plantation kitchens. Yeah. Just got goosebumps. There's something very powerful about that. There's something very subversive about that. There's something very empowering of hearing the stories of these men and women who were forced to convert to Christianity, forced to cook, be part of that household, use that status to get some benefits for their family. There was something about that that they were in there conjuring and that I guarantee when those parties were happening and those folks were coming up from the field and some of them white kids coming in there, they were asking for favors that was not food, or sustenance, but something bigger and very spiritual and religious that has deep roots in their West African homeland. I want to finish my talk tonight by introducing you to two chefs. The first is, a, is someone I have a hot spot, uh, sort of a huge warm spot in my heart. Um, this is not Hercules. I don't know if you've been following this, but I was crushed when I found out that that portrait that supposedly was Chef Hercules is not Hercules, but I'm still going to use it because it's, it's some dignified West African guy that was a chef, and you know what? We don't have an image of Hercules, so he's just going to have to do. <laughs> I'm going to introduce you to him first, then I'm going to talk about the woman on my book cover. Hercules, as we fast, it's longer in the book, Hercules was what I consider the first celebrity chef in America. He was born in 1754. George Washington purchased him when he was 16 years old. He married a woman named uh, Alice, who was a seamstress at Mount Vernon. They had three children, Richard, Delia, and Evie. His wife dies shortly after the youngest was born. There's a record in 1786 of, of him being 32 years old and learning how to cook in the kitchen at Mount Vernon with a man named Nate. Now, in late 1790, George Washington starts heading up to Philadelphia. He's the president. He's going to be up there, and not the White House, but he's going to be up there in the presidential home in, in Philadelphia, which is now gone, which breaks my heart, but the archaeology is still there. Uh, he goes up there, and he brings with him um, some of his select enslaved domestics. One of them is Hercules. Hercules is going to learn um, under a man named Samuel Francis, who was a very well-known tavern keeper of, of racially mixed origin from New York. He comes down, and he trains Hercules to be the presidential chef, right? You go from being enslaved on a plantation, you work your way up, you end up in Philadelphia, and you are George Washington's chef. Imagine who he cooked for. Philadelphia during this period had a vibrant and fairly large free black community. Hercules was allowed to go and to, to and from the market. He met people as he was out. There's a, a George Washington's step-grandson has a phenomenal account of him. It's in my book. And it goes something like this. I'm going to abridge it here. So Hercules ran his kitchen like Gordon Ramsay or someone like He doesn't say that, obviously. But, you know, like <laughs> tight kitchen, right? Kitchen is like shut down. Everything is like perfect, you know, military style kitchen. He goes and he gets dressed up every night. He puts on his silk stockings. He puts on his velvet coat, his gold uh, chain, his hat cut, a cane that he's going to walk down the street with. Sounds a little familiar from 70s, but that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> he walks down Market Street and white men bow to him. Yeah. He is the president's chef. He is meeting heads of state, heads of nations from everywhere coming to Philadelphia. He is meeting free blacks. He sees that freedom. Now, something that George Washington didn't know, which blew my mind when I did the research on this, when he was moving up there, he did not know that Philadelphia or Pennsylvania had what was called the Gradual Emancipation Act already put into place. You couldn't have enslaved people there for six months or they'd be free. 
Jefferson panics, riding back and forth, doesn't tell his enslaved domestics, including Oni Judge and others. He keeps that real quiet. But you know, as Hercules is walking around and meeting people, I'm sure he found that out. He continues to network, to cook food, the kind of food that he sold for over $200 a, a year out of the back uh, door of the kitchen. It's a lot of money in the 1790s. You had the celebrity status, this man who had skills and class, right? It's feeling what it's like to not just be a free man in the United States, but to be someone who goes back then every five months and change, which is what George Washington did, to then be re-enslaved for a couple of days on that Virginia soil and then brought back, back and forth. Now, the crazy thing about all this, he did that for five years. Washington shipped him back and forth for five years. All those trips, probably different ways. I'm sure he met people along the way. I'm sure he met people at the ports. I'm sure he met a lot of different folks that could finally help him escape. So on George Washington's birthday, which was just last weekend, 1797, before that, I'm sorry, December 1796 is when Hercules returns back to Mount Vernon and he's on record shoveling manure. A couple months later, George Washington wakes up. It's his birthday. Hercules is gone. He went to New York for a while. They don't know where he went. My theory was like, oh, he must have gone to Spain. This is where they found this portrait. Who knows? But he got out. And that's why I love his story, because it's, it's different, right? I want to now talk for a moment about the woman on the front of my book. I had choices for the cover of my book, and I didn't pick Hercules. Um, I didn't pick Hercules for several reasons, but I'm going to tell you why right now. 1855, David Hunter Strother traveled around the South documenting, you know, Southern life and culture. He stops by this small little plantation home in Amherst County, right near Lynchburg, Virginia. And he spends the night, and he is so taken with their cook that he stops and he draws her. And he writes in this recollection that her children have the first, you know, dip in all gravies, eats the breast, eat the, the breast of their fried chickens, and that he's never met anybody so important than this enslaved cook. Her name was not recorded, as were most people in slavery. She represents the countless men and women and children who were enslaved, who do not have their name recorded. They were named, but they do not have a record of that. So the fact that I chose not a nameless, a recordless woman in some ways, to represent all of the men and women that I hope that my book brings voice to. I'm going to end my talk by saying that my work, I hope, redefines the ways in which you think about Aunt Jemima. And this is, of course, one of my favorites, Liberation of Aunt Jemima by Betty Sarr, 1972 in Berkeley, California. I wasn't alive yet, but it is my hometown, so I'm a little proud of that. Um, but again, redefining right who this woman is. There has been many attempts over the years to push back against this happy slave narrative, this loyal slave narrative, this Aunt Jemima fantasy that Americans are in love with. And I'm hoping that my book is not the definitive, because it's not, but I hope that it invites people to think critically about our history in this country, about American food, and about the history and legacy and culture of enslaved chefs in Virginia. Thank you.